all of us, nothing between us and God, our faces shining with the brightness of his face. And so we are transfigured much like the Messiah, our lives gradually becoming brighter and more beautiful as God enters our lives and we become like him. Hey, thanks so much for joining in tonight to our online gathering. Worship was incredible. We're going to continue in pressing into Jesus by looking and dissecting the scriptures to see him, to hear him, and ultimately to become like him. Uh, Today we're going to really talk about becoming resilient disciples, kind of this subtopic within our teaching series. And I'm going to be specifically teaching from this subject, becoming resilient disciples, following the teachings of Jesus. A few weeks ago, I I gave us some practicals for how we might become resilient disciples. And those practicals were being with Jesus, Becoming like Jesus, which this whole entire teaching series is about. So really we're focusing on being with Jesus, following the teachings of Jesus, and doing what Jesus did. So this week we're going to talk about following the teachings of Jesus. I want to open up the scriptures to kind of get our minds, the gears of our minds, thinking along the lines of following the teachings of Jesus. If you want to Open up your scriptures or uh, open up your Bible app to James chapter 1, James 1, 22 to 25. It says this, but don't just listen to God's word or God's teachings. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you are only fooling yourself. In the words of the great philosopher, Mr. T, don't be a fool. It's terrible. I don't know. It just came to me. For if you listen to the word and don't obey, it is like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself, walk away, and forget what you look like. But if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, what is that perfect law? It's the great command, the greatest command that Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbors as you love yourself. So as you carefully look into that perfect law, which sets you free, and if you do what it says, and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. Come on, let's pray. Let's put that Mr. T reference behind us in Jesus name and let's pray. God, thank you. Thank you for every single person that is watching today. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would you would fill every single space just as people have encountered your presence in worship. I pray that we would encounter your love, your goodness, the heart your heart for us, which is pure and full of mercy. Thank you for what you're doing in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. I want to talk about three major forces at work in the cor- in the current West for you and I's allegiance. The first one is a political leader and or a political movement a political leader and or a political movement. We are seeing this now more than ever in in light of our cultural moment here in America. Isn't this true? You see, politics has become the religion of today. Politics has become the religion of today. People in the West have become zealous. They become, they become pharisaical. They become gospel bearers of a political leader or a political movement. The political gospel calls for our faith and our allegiance and our orientation to its ways for the hope of salvation and restoration according to its leader or its message. Man, 
If there is a current force in the major West at war for you and I's allegiance, wouldn't you say that it's a political leader and or a political movement? We could just say politics. Number two is hyper-individualism. This, this, my friends, is so prevalent today in the West. Culture, whether it's music, fashion, or even coffee, perpetuates an intense living for me and myself. In the world of hyper-individualism, one's personal opinions are elevated as absolute truth. There's void or shallow amounts of submission to authority or correction. Hyper-individualism, it focuses on self-identification, self-discovery, self-expression, self-worth, self-gain, self-advantage, and the list of self goes on. Hyper-individualists have become their own moral compass, and their own higher authority. Thus is the force of hyper-individualism. Now, in light of those two, there is another force at work that is subtle, yet is just as strong, even more strong those, than those two, and that Third force is the Spirit of God. I love how, I love the scripture of Genesis chapter 1 verses 1 and 2. Literally the, 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 the beginning of our Judeo-Christian scriptures. We read this. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and empty. And darkness covered the deep waters. And the Spirit of God was hovering. I love that. I love this imagery. That the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. The Holy Spirit is the manifest presence of God. And the Holy Spirit is still hovering across the earth today. The Holy Spirit is a strong force hovering in the west And how is the Holy Spirit hovering? The Holy Spirit is hovering, friends, for awakening and revival. The Holy Spirit is hovering throughout the world for awakening and revival. Awakening of the darkest souls and the darkest cultures and revival to revive the sleepiest Jesus people. And though and, and communities of faith that have fallen asleep in their faith, if you eliminate any corruption within the vision of politics and hyper individualism, and you look solely at the good of those two's visions, here's what each of those visions will boil down to: the vision of po- the politics is is justice, equality, a better future. And a better world. The vision of hyper individualism, the, the vision of hyper individualism is, is freedom, flourishing of soul, happiness, and diversity. Now, if you look closely at both of those visions, we get glimpses of the very kingdom of God at work throughout the earth. But what is subtle or what is alluring about those two visions is this. Is those two visions want the kingdom but doesn't want the king. Those two visions, they, they, they propel, they, 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 they have this gospel message that talks about justice and equality or freedom and flourishing of self in such a way that it wants the blessings of the kingdom of God, but it wants nothing to do with the king of the kingdom of God. When it comes to the vision of God's spirit, I love how Jesus really gives us 
clear insight to the vision of God's Spirit. In Luke 4, verses 18 and 19, Jesus is found and he unrolls this scroll. This is really the beginning of his public ministry uh, according to the Gospel of Luke. And, and it says this, the, and Jesus wrote, uh, read this, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, my God, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus, listen to this, lean in here. Jesus is at the center of the Spirit's vision. You see, in the beginning of Luke chapter 4, it says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. In other words, the Spirit of the Lord's vision is, is married to the person of Jesus. And when the Spirit of the Lord's vision is married to the, the, the person of Jesus, friends, that is when we see the fulfillment of God's vision, or the, uh, the Spirit's vision start to take place here on earth. I love how Proverbs 19, 18, it says it this way. This is a verse from the Old Testament, and it says it this way. When people do not accept divine guidance or vision, they run wild. They run wild. Some interpretations say that they perish. And, the, and Proverbs 19, uh, 29, 18 goes on, and it says, But whoever obeys the law... Or in other words, whoever obeys the teachings of Jesus is joyful. The big idea for today's teaching is that resilient disciples live submitted to the vision of God's Spirit through the orientation of Jesus' teachings. You see, as we look throughout the life of Jesus seen in the scriptures, we see that Jesus prayed. Jesus fasted, Jesus was generous, Jesus served, Jesus meditated on the scriptures, Jesus lived in community, Jesus went to church, he lived in community, Jesus lived and walked in the Spirit's power, and Jesus practiced each of these spiritual disciplines in communion. This is so important. He practiced all of these spiritual disciplines, not apart, but in communion with his Father. Now we have to understand that historically, historically, a, the Jesus, Jesus people have believed in what we call the Trinity. And the Trinity is this mysterious comprisal of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. But Throughout time, throughout time, the church or Jesus people have gotten it, gotten it wrong by not worshiping or pressing into the Trinity, but have lived for what is called the quaternity. The quaternity. In other words, it's four things that is comprised of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and God the Bible. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and God the Bible. Listen, friends, Jesus did not worship the Bible or the teachings of his day. The Bible does not call us to worship the Bible. The Bible leads us to God. The Bible is an aid so that we might see the goodness of our God. But the Bible itself is not deity. The Bible itself is not imminent. The Bible itself is not God. Now, why do I bring that up? It's because if we really are going to talk about following the teachings of Jesus, we need to understand the, the proper place of the Bible. Friends, 
We need to wholeheartedly worship God, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. We need to lean into our identity that is found in the Father. We need to lean into the saving grace that is found in Jesus. We need to lean into the, to the dynamic power, the overcoming strength of the Spirit. We need to worship our God wholeheartedly. But friends... Resilient disciples do not worship the Bible. Rather, resilient disciples come to the teachings of Jesus to worship Jesus. So that is extremely important as we look at the life of Jesus' disciplines, his spiritual disciplines, so that we too might have a proper framework as we set out as resilient disciples to follow the teachings of Jesus. Now, I love this part. Jesus teaches about scripture's teachings. He he, he takes the scriptures and he, he teaches on it and he gives us insight to it. I want to look at really five quick things about the teachings of Jesus. Jesus's teachings on scripture's teachings. The first is this, is that the teachings of Jesus are substance for you and I's soul. The teachings of Jesus are substance for our soul. Listen to these words of Jesus. But Jesus told him, No. The scriptures say, People do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. That was from Matthew 4 4. The teachings of Jesus are the very substance for you and I soul, that we don't look to the things of this world. We don't look to our accolades. We don't look to our accomplishments. We don't look to another person, whether it's our spouse or it's an, it's a person that we idolize in culture or in our own world, whatever it may be. We don't look to those things as substance for our soul. This, the teachings of Jesus are very clear in that it's the teachings of Jesus are the very substance for you and I. Number two, the teachings of Jesus led to greater revelation and the power of God. Man, I love this. The teachings of Jesus led to greater revelation from glory to glory, from strength to strength, and the power of God. Listen to this. In Matthew 22, verse 29, Jesus replied, your mistake He's saying, he's talking to the Pharisees. He's talking about to the the religious conservatives of the day. He's saying, your mistake is that you don't know the scriptures and you don't know the power of God. You see these Pharisees, they they lived in such a way that they were higher than others, that they they had to protect the holy scriptures. They had to protect the ways of God. But what they were protecting, they didn't even know. And Jesus says, you don't even know the scriptures that you read. And you don't even know the power of God that comes with what you read. You see, the teachings of Jesus, it leads us. They lead us to greater revelation of his goodness, of his love. And yes, to the things that are mysterious that those of us that follow Jesus will never understand until we meet him in heaven. But the point is, is that there is such great revelation that God is inviting us into. There is such great power that God is inviting us into. And one of those ways that God is inviting us is through the means, is through the avenue of the teachings of Jesus. Man, this is good. Number three, the teachings of Jesus are eternal. The teachings of Jesus are eternal. Friends, We don't know if this thing will be in heaven. But what we do know is that the teachings of Jesus found in the scriptures will be in heaven. They are eternal. Matthew 24, verse 35, Jesus says this, Heaven and earth will disappear, but my my words will never disappear. Here again, Jesus is quoting another verse. Isaiah 40, verse 8, from the Old Testament. Again, Jesus was well read. And from the day of old, of the Old Testament, to the days of Jesus, and today to 2020, the teachings of Jesus have eternity embedded in them. 
Number four, the teachings of Jesus, they point to Jesus. I love this. The teachings of Jesus, they point to Jesus. The greatest way for you and I to get to know God more and more on a consistent level is through the scriptures. Why? Because the scriptures are how we get to know the Father, how we get to know the character of our God, to get to know the failures or the sins or the rebellion of our own human flesh. You see, the scriptures, they point to Jesus. In Luke 24, verses 44 and 45, it says this, Then he said, Jesus said this, When I was with you before, I told you that everything written about me in the law of Moses. Now those that were listening, if it was like an 8-track, they would have went, It would stop right there, and they'd be like, "Wait, wait a minute. Written about you in the law of Moses, Jesus, what are you talking about? How could those teachings be talking about you? Because there is prophetic nature within the entire Old Testament that points to Jesus. The Old Testament, it points to Jesus. The New Testament, it points to Jesus. Let me finish. And then it says this, in the, the, uh, Everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and in the Psalms, they must be fulfilled. Then he opened up their minds to understand the scriptures. In that moment, there was this supernatural moment uh, within all of those that were listening to the words of Jesus while Jesus was speaking those words. And Jesus said everything that was written in the Old Testament, it points to me. And then it says that Jesus opened up their minds. Boom. That there was intellectual understanding. That there was dots being connected for the first time uh, for these ancient Jews to see, whoa, the Moses, Jesus is the greater Moses. Whoa, Abraham, Jesus is our great Abraham. And they all of a sudden the ancient Jews started to connect the dots. Why? Because the entire scriptures point to Jesus. Fifth and last one, and we're going to move on. The teachings of Jesus point to eternal life through Jesus. Man, I love this. John 5, verse 39, it says this. Jesus says these words, You search the scriptures because you think they give you eternal life. Again, we do not worship the quaternity. The Bible itself does not give us eternal life. I, I, I was, I was, I'm a huge fan of the TV show called Lost. And I, I listened to some of the behind the scene interviews from the producers of Lost. And the producers of Lost, I can't remember their names, but they essentially said this, not word for word, but they said this, a lot of their ideas they got from the Bible. Harry Potter, the, the number one book, the, the, the second most sold book behind the Bible, Harry Potter, the author of Harry Potter, read the Bible to get ideas from the Bible for Harry Potter. Just because they read the book doesn't mean that they inherit eternal life. And this is what Jesus is saying. You search the scriptures because you think they give you eternal life. Listen to these words. Jesus then says, but the scriptures point to me. Jesus is saying, you're searching in all the wrong places. You're looking in pages to see a savior when I'm standing right in front of you. Here I am, Jesus, the savior of your soul. The only thing that will save, the only thing that will truly correct us, to the transformation of his likeness is not the scriptures itself, but Jesus within the scriptures. I want to now go to a bit more practical level here. How do we practically engage with the teachings of Jesus? How do we practically engage with the teachings of Jesus? Well, I want to show you this, this diagram here to kind of give us a bit more uh, simplicity to the, the, uh, the practices of following Jesus. The first one, it starts off with fertile soul. Fertile soul. 
Luke chapter 8, verse 11 through 15, it says this. This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is God's word. This is Jesus speaking. The seed is God's word. The seed that falls that fell on the footpath represent those who hear the message, the teachings of Jesus, only to have the devil come and take it away from their hearts and prevent them from believing and being saved. The seeds on the rocky soil represent those who hear the message and receive it with joy. But since they don't have deep roots, they believe for a while, then they fall away when they face temptation. The seeds that fell among the thorns represents those who hear the message, but all too quickly, um, all too quickly, the message is crowded out, out, crowded out by the cares and riches and pleasures of this life, and so they never grow into maturity. And the seeds that fell on good soil, on fertile soil, represent honest, good-hearted people who hear God's word. They cling to it and patiently produce a huge harvest. God wants a humble and hungry heart. A heart that its environment, the environment of its heart is fertile for the growth of Christ's likeness within you and I. Number two on this diagram is transformative sacrifice. Transformative sacrifice. Romans 12, 1 through 2 says this, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because He all because of all He has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind He will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship Him or live for Him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. What precedes transformation is our sacrifice. It's nearly impossible for us to be transformed without sacrifice. Sacrifice precedes transformation. God is asking that we might sacrifice in order to be transformed. What kind of sacrifice is he asking for? Maybe he's asking you to sacrifice your time so that you might pursue him. Maybe he's asking you to sacrifice your efforts, that you might partner with his mission here on earth, here in Belltown. Maybe God is asking that you would sacrifice your rebellious lifestyle, your rebellious habits, so that you might live set apart, holy unto him. Whatever your sacrifice may be, if we want to follow the teachings of Jesus and see the full harvest on the other end, friends, we have to understand that God is inviting us to cultivate an environment of our heart that has that is fertile. So then we can Go to the next level or we can partner with that. This transformative sacrifice. Third is grace-infused discipline. I love this one. Grace-infused discipline. Listen to these words of Jesus. Then he said to the crowd, If any of you wants to follow, be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross daily, and follow me. Reality is, is we need the grace of God to follow Jesus. We can't, we couldn't do this on our own before the grace of God. And we cannot continue to do it on our own without the grace of God. Reality is, is you and I as resilient disciples to, to, to really orient our lives around the teachings of Jesus. We need the grace of God. We need his strength daily as we surrender, die to ourselves, and follow Jesus. And lastly, I'm going to finish with this, is holistic flourishing. Holistic flourishing. Back to our reading text, the beginning of this teaching, James chapter 1, verses 22 to 25. But don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says, otherwise you are only fooling yourself. 
For if you listen to the word and don't obey, it is like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself, walk away, and you forget what you look like. But if you look carefully into the perfect law, the law of love that sets you free, and if you do what it says and don't forget what you've heard, then then God will bless you for doing it. Listen, our holistic flourishing includes our f- includes flourishing of our heart life, our soul life, and our mind life. And it is the desire of God. Hear me. It is the desire of God to bring about blessing and flourishing in you and I's holistic life. Jesus doesn't desire that we just grow. Jesus wants us whole. Jesus doesn't want us just to grow. He wants us whole. And as we hear the teachings of Jesus, Jesus by his spirit, the spirit is hovering over the spaces of our hearts, over our minds, over the environments of our souls in such a way that the spirit is wanting to awaken holistic flourishing with in us. Flourishing is evident of God's heart for humanity. It has been the plan of God since day one that humanity would flourish. I love the picture of garden of the Garden of Eden. Uh, there was no sickness. There was no death. There was only perfect communion between man and God in the coolness of the day. And it was in that place that there was flourishing. God loves you so much to leave you the way that you are. But God loves you too much to not empower you to change, to become more like Him, to live a life that is holistically full of flourishing. The solution to human flourishing, holistic flourishing, hear me now, is not the powers of a political leader or a political agenda. The solution isn't within ourselves. You and I, we fail ourselves all the time. And yet we are we are aching for we are aching for flourishing. The solution to holistic flourishing lies within Jesus. And now Jesus by his spirit is inviting you and I to live as resilient disciples that we might orient or reorient our ways and our practices to the teachings of Jesus. Politics is not the solution. Ourselves are not the solution. The only solution for this cultural moment at large, as well for the culture of our heart, is the person of Jesus. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, thank you for what you're doing. I ask that now that you would awaken hearts to your goodness, awaken hearts to your love for those that are watching right now and have yet to surrender their lives to you, wholly surrender their lives to you, God, by your spirit, awaken them, woo them, call them. Lord, those of us that need revival of heart, revival of mind, God, our whole selves need revival. I pray by your spirit that you would revive us. We repent and we ask for your forgiveness for wherever we have turned wrong, God, and wherever we have led our our own selves to go astray from the things that we know to be true from our own place in you. God, I pray that you would revive us right now by your love, God. I pray that your love has never left us. I pray that those who are listening right now, that the love of God has never left you, that the love of God will never leave you. Nothing in heaven or in earth will separate you from the love of God that is found in Christ Jesus. God, I pray that you'd revive us. Revive us to not only be resilient disciples in private, but God, that in public we might live as resilient disciples that 
partner with you for the flourishing of humanity, for the flourishing of our cities, for the flourishing of our neighborhoods, for the flourishing of our homes. God, we are asking what we cannot do. Do it again by your spirit. Lord, we love you. We trust you. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen. May we become resilient disciples that orient our ways to the teachings of Jesus. Thanks so much for tuning in tonight. Love you.